Hello, everyone, and welcome to the AWS Nordics Office Hours with me, Jonar Grosch. I'm a developer advocate here at AWS based in Sweden. And this is our weekly show where I bring on experts, AWS experts, uh, guests to talk about specific AWS topic. And we want to have an interactive show where you, our viewers, ask questions and hopefully get those answered throughout the hour. And this week, I'm very happy to be joined by Stefano Sandrini to talk about full stack web and mobile development. Welcome to the show, Stefano. Thank you, Gunnar. It's super pleasure to be here with you. So we always do a quick round of introductions. So do the quick introduction, please, Stefano. Okay, Stefano is here, um, uh, Principal Solutions Architect at AWS. Um, next month, it's going to be four years at AWS for me. Uh, so close to the anniversary, let's say. Um, joining in 2018, basically the first year and a half, I was in the Italian team. Uh, and then I moved to uh, basically being an, an expert, right? A kind of a specialist, a uh, solutions architect, covering modern application and more specifically front end web and mobile development and uh, um, all the services that you can use to do uh, front end web and mobile development. So, probably if some of you in the audience uh, are already a customer of AWS, maybe you already had a chat. Uh, in, the, in the last two years, probably. Uh, and then uh, recently I moved back to the Italian team, but I'm still basically covering, you know, all these topics for, for the whole Europe uh, territory. And recently we had the pleasure of having you as a speaker at the AWS Summit in Stockholm to basically talk about the same topics. So, so delighted to have you here with me on Twitch as well. Thank you so much. And as I mentioned, the, the topic of today is full stack web and mobile development, of course. And traditionally, when we talk about the cloud, the focus is usually on the infrastructure or perhaps on the back end, if you wish. So why do full stack on, on the cloud, Stefan? Yeah, I think it's um, a matter of the evolution of the role of a well front end developer, basically. So the concept is that if you look at the history of front-end development and the evolution that we had, yes, of course, initially front-end developers, they were about building the UI and the user experience, and that was it. And then someone else uh, was building basically uh, the backend and the whole infrastructure. But something happened, uh, I don't want to say recently, but at least in the last five, six, seven years, let's say. So if you think about you know, for example, the introduction of serverless, the ability to run the code in the cloud, uh, and maybe you are a JavaScript developer as a front-end developer. Maybe you can leverage Node to actually leverage the same skills you have uh, to actually build um, business code, business logic code for the backend as well, running running on serverless, or running, for example, on AWS Lambda, right? Um, and same for other technologies, uh, I don't know, for example, uh, GraphQL. Uh, no matter what is the engine you, you may want to use in GraphQL, um, we have one uh, with AWS AppSync, but it's not really important that. Um, if you think about GraphQL, it, it's really a game changer for front-end developers because it provides front-end developers the ability to actually query just the data that they need nothing more and nothing less and in the shape that they need. So basically it's kind of seeing the development of an application and the integration with an API put in the other way around. So you define the user experience, you define the view, you build your view, and then you define the way you want your, your data to be uh, provided by the API. It's, it's really a game changer. So if you, if you think about uh, let's say this evolution, um, what happened, uh, let's say what we saw in the last three, four years as AWS, um, there is um, a good amount of front-end developers that are actually building full stack features because of these uh, uh, new technologies. So at the end of the day, uh, we as AWS, we try to basically solve uh, some uh, issues that 
front-end developers might have when they build full stack features. For example, uh, leveraging the cloud. They want to leverage the cloud because of the scalability, high availability, uh, and also because maybe they want to leverage some managed service, right? Uh, the concept is that, is that sometimes it's hard, let's say, to learn uh, all the services, all the nuts and bolts for, for every single service. So the concept is let's try to provide some solutions, let's say, to have front-end developers to actually build full stack. So that's the concept, basically. Giving you, as a front-end developer, the ability to build um, full stack, not just the front-end, but back-end, do the integration and basically managing the infrastructure in, in an easier way. Uh, so you don't have to learn everything before going to, to production, basically. So that's the concept at the end of the day. And would you say that it's easier for a front end developer to, to learn to then do the back end to become full stack this way than, than perhaps the other way around? Um, yeah, this is this is a very common question that uh, usually we we uh, receive as specialist subject marketer expert. Uh, I think so because um, if you if you look at about the technology stack, you can basically leverage all your skills if you if you go this way, right? You already have knowledge around JavaScript, and probably you can. Yeah, learn a bit of Node.js and understanding how to build a Lambda function, for example, mm. to to do um, backend. If you do the other way around, probably uh, you still have to know or to learn new things, new runtimes, new technologies. So it's not, I mean, it's not the same path. I don't want to say that it's it's impossible, of course, the other way around, but probably the easiest way is from the front end to full stack instead of back end to full stack. Also because... I mean, if you look again at the timeline, let's say, of the evolution, right, of, of uh, front-end development, there are so many frameworks uh, available for our, you know, for our, for our customers. If you are a back-end developer, you need to learn at least one of them. Sometimes it's not easy if you're not used to it, right? Uh, while probably if you are a front-end developer, you already uh, know it. And then you can just leverage pure JavaScript to do the backend. So we have a question from the chat from Onkars. Being a full stack developer, we must have the knowledge of other languages too. You, you touched on, on JavaScript, yeah, Node.js. Yeah. If you if you have if you have knowledge around JavaScript, uh, probably it's easier for you to just use Node.js to build to build um, a business logic. The interesting thing is that uh, the way we are trying to solve uh, this requirement, let's say, is to avoid um, basically writing too much code on the back end. So if you really need to write business logic in the back end, you can use Lambda. If you're a JavaScript developer, you can use Node. Maybe you are a Python developer. You use, I don't know, some, some Python framework to build a website. Maybe you can use Python on, on Lambda as well, for example. So you have plenty of options. I think that if you are a front end developer and you know JavaScript, probably that's that's the only thing that you really need. Again, also because there are some features that we want to provide uh, that basically doesn't require writing any code or very few lines of code. So it's not a like a big deal. Uh, and maybe this is one of the differences that that I think people some are struggling with at times com coming from say a rest api background you're used to building rest apis always having that compute layer doing things with the data before it's delivered through the api compared to graphql yeah i think that uh, there are two two things uh, again graphql make it easier for you to just pick what you need uh, and i think again this is super important because it provides efficiency it provides efficiency, uh, for example, in the interaction, less, uh, let's say, less size of payload. It's it's smaller, basically, and uh, not too many round trip for retrieving data. So definitely that's one thing. The other thing is that through GraphQL, uh, again, depending on the engine, but let's say you're using AWS AppSync, for example, 
uh, you can really leverage integration between the GraphQL layer provided by AppSync and some of the services you, you may have in the backend that, that actually contains data, like, I don't know, DynamoDB. So you can really get data in an easier way without writing too much code. And again, the interesting thing is that it's a really different paradigm because if you are used to use REST API, REST API is, in the definition itself, you, you, you define an entity, right? And then you provide operation on that entity. And the entity usually it's related to what you have in the data source you, you might have. Usually it's, it goes like that. Uh, with GraphQL, again, the interesting thing is that you can define the type that you need um, without having a one-to-one -one match from this type and what you have in your data source, okay? Again, this is maybe something a little bit more advanced. So if you are getting started today, probably you're going to use something uh, out of the box, like what, what's provided uh, out of the box by Amplify Studio, which actually creates some sort of one-to-one -one mapping. But then when you, when you scale your application, so you customize your application, you make it more complex, then you can really leverage the power of, of GraphQL because again, you can provide different types. Maybe a type is something that it's not stored anywhere. It's just a collection of something else. And this is super powerful because again, you can just, let's say you are building a, I don't know, a newsfeed type of application and you just uh, request, hey, give me the homepage and everything is there, which is one request. If you design, uh, if you design the, the, the schema, the GraphQL schema in the right way, this is the real efficiency, avoiding overfetching, which is basically an issue you may have with REST API because you, you, you ask for something and you get the whole payload. You can't basically say, I just need these three fields. So you have an overfetching with GraphQL, right. you can do that. And also, again, you can just uh, avoid um, too many round trips, just one request potentially, again, if the schema is designed in the right way, or definitely, uh, less request than than REST. You don't have what is called the N plus one problem, right? Usually with the, with the REST approach, you have what is called the N, N plus one problem. You perform a request, you got a list, and then for every single item in the list, you probably need to perform a request to get the detail, right? So you have overfetching in every single um, request, and also you are doing a lot of requests. Usually with GraphQL, you don't you don't do it that way. You you just perform a single request, and you have and you can specify on the client side what's needed basically. So I, I see in the chat as well that Surely Dev has answered to Onkars as well, and, and just basically written that even though you don't need to know the the languages in detail, having an appreciating appreciation for them and and basic knowledge is good to be able to to work together so i like that comment yeah, we also yeah. have uh, a comment from one of our regulars um which i think is more of a statement and to have your thoughts on it AppSync and the suit of data sources helps you build with bootstrapped code but the knowledge of vt vtl is much needed so any thoughts on that? Perhaps explain what VTL is. Yeah, yeah, of course. So VTL is basically a velocity template language. It is a language to, to actually define templates. Um, and you can define um, mapping from the incoming request, which is basically GraphQL request, to uh, the downstream request. Let's say you want to query DynamoDB, for example. You have to change these. Uh, this request, right? Because DynamoDB doesn't know anything about GraphQL payload. So you have to change the request. And the same thing is for the response, right? So you got the response from your data source and you, and you, you must change it to make it compatible with your GraphQL schema. So that's basically uh, the, the, you know, the dummy version uh, for, for what, is, what is VTL. Then what happens um, in VTL, you can basically put uh, business logic code. So again, you, since you can transform requests, you can also uh, aggregate data or you can make some uh, checks. For example, you can access, I don't know, the authorization token provided in the request to just you know, double check what, what the token 
uh, present uh, in the claims section, for example, I don't know, uh, groups, roles for mm -hmm. a specific users, right? So you can really build a complex, complex business logic in VTL. Again, it's really depending on the use case and what is your uh, your current knowledge. I think that what we provide out of the box uh, is something that is super valuable if you are getting started because the VTL is auto generated for you uh, by by Amplify, which is a good thing because um, then you can use those templates to actually maybe. I don't know, use them as a blueprint for your next project. Um, you always have to remember that this is a sort of a journey. It's not like, okay, maybe I'm going to start with Amplify, for example, and everything is happen happening as magic, let's say, and then that's it. Uh, usually it's a journey, right? The 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 set of services that AWS try to, to, to provide, um, it's... It's a set of services exactly because it's a journey. So in a very um, Amazonian way, you know, you, you know, Gunnar, that I like to always say, you have to use the right tool for the job. Mm -hmm. This is one of my <laughs> favorite sentence, favorite quote. And again, um, the concept is you can start building full stack if you don't need complex business logic. And then you have time to add complex business logic in VTL, for example, but it's not mandatory to getting started. It's mandatory if you want to start doing something that is more complex. Of course, if you want to do something more complex, yes, maybe you can do it. Maybe you have to do it. Um, I think that it's not mandatory. And, um, and uh, yeah, the other thing that I know uh, I feel our customers pain around VTL, it's not the easiest runtime for a developer. Let's say, um, but I think it's it's a kind of one-to-one um, -one mapping with what we have, for example, with API Gateway. With API Gateway, you can use VTL to do basically the same thing: request and response. So I think that it makes sense if you think about it. Again, if you really need to to add a complex business logic, yes, it can be challenging. Um, you can always use Lambda, for example. So you can use what is called a direct Lambda resolver. Again, it's using the right tool for the job. Um, so if you don't want to use VTL, you can use a direct Lambda resolver. Of course, you're using a Lambda function and not the standard resolver. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's another option. So again, you you have different layers that you can, uh, you can play with uh, in defining your architecture. So keep your questions and comments coming in the chat. We're 18 minutes into the show. Haven't seen any code, any demos yet, Stefano. So I think let's get to it. Yeah, OK, OK. Um, walk us, let, walk us yeah. through what's going to happen uh, for the rest of the show, maybe. Yeah, basically, what we're going to do is we're going to create a new Amplify uh, app, a new Amplify backend app, and basically, We'll try to understand how I can use what is called Amplify Studio to build the backend of my application and build the UI of my application. Bind UI and the backend together, and then how to use um, the components that I binded uh, between UI and, and data in my code, in my React code, for example. So we're going to have a look at uh, how you can do data modeling, how you can create content, for example, uh, how you can do deployment, for example, things like that. And all of that in 40 minutes. We'll try it. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's get to it. What do we okay. see on screen right now? This is basically, let's say, the landing page for, for Amplify, right? So if you, if you search for Amplify here, right? Uh, this is basically the page you are going to to land, right? And uh, there is a list of application. There is also a list here, and of course you have links in the doc to the docs and the support. And then you can create a new app, basically. And again, creating a new app, it's actually a selection. So as you can see, you have host web app and you have build an app. So why we have these two options? 
Because Amplify is a lot of things, actually. It's a set of features and tools and frameworks and command line interface commands and as a studio, uh, a web application that you can use to build your application, but also to host your application. So the concept, again, is if you are a front-end developer, probably, and you want to do full-stack development in the cloud, probably you need help let's say, in three phases of the development lifecycle. The build part, the ship part, so hosting the web application, and also the scale part, so make it more complex, expand your application, uh, change the default behavior, for example. So that's why when you do new app, when you push new, the new app button, you actually have a selection. We're going to use build an app because we want to build an app. We don't have an app that we want to host, right? So we can click build an app and let's call it live demo app. Confirm deployment. So what happens here? Uh, as you can see, setting up Amplify Studio. So here behind the scene, Amplify is doing two things. It is setting up Amplify Studio, which is basically a web application. You see some screenshot here, right? Um, you see some screenshot of the web application that you can use to manage the application. But also, um, Amplify is basically deploying behind the scene the very first environment of your application, of your, let's say, backend application in the cloud. So what does it mean? It means that um, with Amplify, you have the concept of environments. So you may have, I don't know, a development environment, a staging environment, a Q&A environment, and the production environment, right? So you can play with these environments having different versions of your backend in the environments, right? And you can manage those environments from the Amplify Studio. Of course, since we just hit the uh, build an app button, that's it. The environment is basically empty, right? There's no backend resources. There's, there's nothing... Uh, there to be to be used uh, by a developer, but uh, that's basically the concept. I think it's it's very important. So as you can see here, we have backend environments tab here, and the very first environment that is has been created is the staging environment, right? So we have the deployment has been completed. We can launch Studio. You can already see this part, which is basically what is the command that you might want to run in your front-end project to connect your front-end project with this backend? We'll see that later on in the demo. But basically, Amplify is just, it's not just um, a web application to manage the app. the app. It's also a framework, a set of library, a set of UI components, and it is also a command line interface. So you can use some commands from your front-end project to actually interact with your backend. You can create resources or you can pull uh, changes you, you made in the cloud through the uh, Amplify Studio web application. So you can keep in sync the integration between your front-end project and the backend. So it's already here to be used if you have a, a front-end project already running. You can pull. There is an app ID and there is an environment, again, staging. Uh, if you have more than one environment, basically other environments will appear here as a list. One interesting thing before we 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 move forward is this part. So if you go to Amplify Studio settings, uh, there is this button here, which is invite users. So an interesting thing is that you can use Amplify Studio without having an AWS account. So if the owner of this backend application which started um, invites you, you can then log in into Amplify Studio without having a specific AWS account or an IAM user, basically. You can just uh, receive an email um, and just change the password, basically, and then you can log in into Amplify Studio. I think it's, it's important because then you can provide access to, for example, business users. There mm -hmm. are some uh, situations where business user wants to define the data model and that's it. They don't have an AWS account or an IAM user. 
And this way you can provide the access. So let's go back here and let's hit Launch Studio. We hit Launch Studio and then Studio is uh, hopefully up and running. Uh, yeah, so this is the landing page, right? Again, name of the app, name of the environment. So live demo app, staging environment. Here is a, there's an interesting thing, things to do next. So kind of a set of suggestions. What, what you should do now that you have your backend environment up and running, empty, but up and running. Uh, you can do data model. You can view and edit the app content. You can configure, log in and sign up, and you can accelerate UI development. These are just few of the things that you can do with Amplify Studio, but probably the most important, the four most important when you start building an application. Create some data model, uh, define contents, define authorization and authentication, so your, your user base, and then build some UI. So I think one last thing before we move forward, as you can see here, you have the history of your development, uh, deployment activity. Everything uh, in Amplify is backed by CloudFormation. So when I was saying uh, behind the scene, Amplify is bootstrapping your, your backend environment. Um, it's basically, there is a CloudFormation stack that has been deployed. And basically this is the CloudFormation stack, right? And in this case, even though you don't really have any resources, it has deployed the initial stack. So then every change you make is updating that stack. Exactly. So basically, if you're building a set of I don't know, resources, if you want to use a new resource, for example, like the one you have in the, um, let me make it bigger, maybe, uh, in the uh, left uh, sidebar, like, I don't, I don't know, storage function, uh, basically a Lambda function, everything is a nested stack of this main stack, mm -hmm. right? And again, maybe you're just a front-end developer, so you, you don't wanna go super deep into how can I write a specific cloud formation to do all these things, right? Yeah, nice, Amplify will do it for you, but you can still access those stack in cloud formation and maybe have a look at it and learn new things, and maybe you can use them as a blueprint for your future project, for example. Mm -hmm. So that's an option. Let's create a data model. So this is how we can create a data model. And well, the very first thing to do is to add a model. So um, I don't want to do the same, the, the standard home buying and sell or rent home uh, type of, uh, of demo that I did, for example, in Stockholm at the summit. So let's do something, uh, as you know, Gunnar, I, I do a lot of things ar around sports. So let's do something about racing, like driver, right? So we may have, uh, I don't know, last name, which is a string. Uh, first name is a string as well. Then we have nationality. And please be aware I'm Italian, so I may misspell uh, something. Um, and as you can see, you have the type here, right? So last name is a string, first name is a string, nationality is probably a string, right? There's nothing strange, let's say. Okay, and then we may have the permanent number. As you know, in some of the uh, championship, there is a permanent number. So drivers keeps the same number. I can say this is an int, probably. And uh, then what else? Let's see if I have something uh, maybe from my, um, how it's called, a real-time GraphQL race that I did in the past. I think we are all set probably, right? Um, oh, well, what we can do, yeah, we can do something like eight of birth just to showcase that we have for example, AWS date. Hmm. So what does it mean? It means that if you put this field as AWS date, uh, everything that has that will be created behind the scenes for us by Amplify will also check the correct format, right? For example, in resolvers, VTL, just to going back to the VTL questions, right? Um, and, and the same thing is for the GraphQL schema. We are saying that that field in the GraphQL schema, I'm coming to the GraphQL in a minute, uh, 
it's going to be a date, an AWS date. So this is not, uh, let's say, a standard primitive type. It's something we created. We have AWS date. We have other AWS, as you can see, type of type of um, field. So this is going to be AWS date. And probably this is going to be URL also, uh, which is um, an AWS URL. So for example, we can show, I don't know, uh, a wiki page uh, some, somewhere else, or maybe we can use it to, to display the image of the driver, for example, right? Okay, so this is uh, our driver, um, our driver um, model. In the right sidebar, let's say, what we have, we have authorization rules. So currently, since we haven't changed anything, as you can see, anyone authenticated with, AP, with an API key, so basically providing an API key when performing a request, will be able to create, read, update, and delete the driver, right? Which is basically means which basically means authenticated and authenticated because I mean we are not talking about a token for a user, which we, we're just talking about an API key. This is usually the very standard way to getting started. If you are in development phase, probably the API key is the way to go. It's a kind of a public type of access, right? You just need an API key. Probably it's not the best. Uh, authorization method for a production type of application, like a production grade application, unless you're building a public API. There is no way with Amplify and AppSync um, to create public APIs. You you must provide some sort of authorization mechanism. The closest public to, to the public API is providing an API key. Basically. Mm. You can modify, of course, authorization rule, right? Uh, you can add other models. For example, we can have constructors, right? Um, name, which is a string, and again, nationality, right? Which is a string again. So if we build this thing here, and now we have constructor and driver, as you can see, now we can add a relationship. So in the data model, we can also create relationship between data. Between, between models, sorry. So for example, I can add a relationship. Basically, I can say that a driver has a relationship with a constructor, one driver to one constructor usually, right? Uh, or you may have many driver to many constructor, but usually, I mean, depending on how many, you know, uh, championship they are, they are doing. Let's say one to one, right? So we have the relationship, and as you can see, you can change the relationship name. You have the cardinality. You, you have the related to, so which is the model uh, that uh, the drivers is related to, right? And then what we can do, uh, we can do two things. We can do save and deploy, and we can do, okay, let's have a look at the GraphQL schema. So before that, let's have a look at the GraphQL schema. And it, this is important. I'm going to explain why. So what's happening when you do data model in Amplify Studio is basically this. Behind the scenes, it will use the Amplify command line interface, reading a GraphQL schema using specific directives provided by Amplify. Again, you don't have to understand everything. You can just use the visual. Right, but just to to give you a hint of what you can do if you're doing everything on your own from your project, let's say your front end project, you can write a GraphQL schema like this. You can say this is going to be a model, which means we are going to save a constructor and a driver to a DynamoDB table, and you have authorization. If you remember, everything was allowed, so the authorization is public, basically, and we have everything also. Um, you have the this part, which is has one. Has one is again another um, amplify directive. It's not standard GraphQL, right? Mm -hmm. And basically, it's a way for amplify to define relationship. When amplify will read this data, this this GraphQL schema, sorry, it will understand. Okay, we have a relationship here. So probably I'm gonna build a constructor ID. Uh, 
field in the in the DynamoDB table. And again, uh, for those of you who mentioned uh, VTL, in the resolver part created um, automatically by Amplify for us, uh, we will have also resolvers to actually fetch the constructor directly based on the uh, on the key uh, global secondary index probably uh, created created on on uh, uh, on the DynamoDB table. So you can do you can do it visually, or you can do the same the very same thing if you are uh, a developer folk and you just want to you just want to do everything on the code in your front end project. You create a, a GraphQL schema and and basically through the command line interface you will uh, obtain the same the same result. So going back here, we can hit save and deploy. So when we hit save and deploy. Are you sure you want to deploy all changes made to the schema? Yes, I'm sure, pretty sure. Let's deploy. So what uh, Amplify is telling us, let me make it bigger. This can take a few minutes. Again, cloud formation behind the scene, right? And uh, um, it, it's, it's pretty straightforward in the definition, right? Amplify will create or update an AWS AppSync endpoint and Amazon end Amazon DynamoDB tables. So basically what's happening here, Amplify is deploying through CloudFormation a GraphQL endpoint provided by AppSync, which is basically a serverless uh, type of GraphQL uh, endpoint, and DynamoDB tables, right? And again, also creating, uh, for, for example, global secondary index or local secondary index, depending on the way you do modeling in your, in your uh, visual tool, right? Uh, and this is going to happen for you basically without without knowing any cloud formation, right? We are knowing anything on GraphQL because we just use the, the visual builder. So you see deploying here, right? And again, we we have here everything that it's running on cloud formation. I, yeah, I, I think what you just showed is it really emphasizes what you said initially that you as a front-end developer, then you don't really have to know what DynamoDB is even, or what AppSync is in this case. You're just defining a data model, no matter what's happening in the backend. Exactly, and that's the concept, right? We want to, 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 to shorten your time to market, let's say. Mm. Then maybe in the future, because you, you must make your application more complex, add additional features, you, you, you may want to to uh, fine tune a bit your application, whatever is the reason, maybe you want to go deeper and understanding what's happening and maybe make some changes, or maybe in the second application you're going to build, you're gonna do something more manual, let's say. But if you are a front-end developer, probably you just need to know, okay, what are my models? And basically what is the authorization? Is, is it public or not? Uh, do we have any relationship? And that's it. And while we are deploying, I'm trying to show uh, this in the um, in the stream. You should see probably, yeah, okay. Yeah. So this is what is going to be deployed uh, currently, right? So the AppSync endpoint, the DynamoDB table in this specific Scenario: We have two DynamoDB tables. Doesn't doesn't change anything. But um, what we are doing uh, again, without knowing anything, um, Amplify will enable uh, a feature that is called Data Store. And uh, the concept of Data Store is again trying to solve uh, or make it easier for you as a front end developer to interact with the API with with the store. With the with the DynamoDB um, data you you may have in the cloud, and how we can do it is basically using uh, API that works like if you are reading or writing data directly in the local device. So you, as a front end developer, you can actually read and write code in your device. And behind the scene, there is this synchronization engine that it's running in your local device that is actually using queries and mutations 
Queries and mutations are operation defined by GraphQL queries to read, mutations to write. And subscriptions. Subscriptions are um, super important if you want to be notified when something changes and you want to be notified in real time. So it works based on a um, secure web socket, right? So behind the scene, you have this synchronization engine. You have query mutation, you have subscriptions, and everything uh, basically works in a transparent way for you. You just need to read and write data from your local device because it's in sync. I think it's I think it's interesting. I think it's uh, um, it's something that is valuable for front end developers because again, it removes the uh, you know the need to learning GraphQL, learning how to be efficient in query definition, in in mutation definition, how to use in an efficient way subscriptions, for example. Again, you just read and write data from your local storage. One of the perhaps most important things about data store for me has been the offline support. <laughs> Having built applications in the past that needed offline support and the amount of code needed to get that working when people were in elevators or in, exactly. I don't know, traveling by train and then getting that data to be synced correctly when they are online again. But with the help of uh, data store, you, you actually get that just as an added benefit. Absolutely. One of the most common use case for data store is what is called the field service application. So again, you, you, are, you have, I don't know, workers um, working on a remote location. You have a very, um, you know, you have a bandwidth or a network that is not stable. So mm -hmm. it goes online and offline all the time. Uh, you, you, you still need to, to use the application, right? So using the local storage is super important because you can use the local storage and then once back online, you have the synchronization. And you have also conflict detection and, and merge. Uh, there, are, there are multiple techniques you can, you can use to do um, conflict detection. Uh, but basically, again, it's, it's there for you to, to, to be used and it's already... Uh, ready in this in this scenario basically right yeah. there's there's nothing that we that we uh created through the cli for example so the deployment um is uh completed um again here we have the command that we can use in the cli to synchronize uh our front-end project with the cli uh also an interesting thing um uh, Amplify will provide you some snippets. Again, maybe you're not very familiar with the whole concept of data store, for example. So you can say, okay, let me try to understand how can I query a driver so I can copy paste all the imports for React, for example, and I can copy paste this dummy query, but basically it's a list of all drivers. Same thing for create, again, uh, this is a dummy create. And as you can see, this is what you are going to do in your front-end application. For example, in this scenario, React. So it's a save. There's nothing like, okay, let's build the payload for the mutation. Let's let's perform the request. Let's put the header with the correct authorization. It's just an API to read and write from the local storage, which is, I think, it's important. And again, basically, it's a dummy um, save method. You can just copy paste in your in your front end application. Same thing for other runtimes. Swift, for example, uh, I've been a mobile developer for years, and so I'm still an Objective C guy, honestly. But Swift <laughs> comes handy for me. Uh, this is this is a, a version for for do create on, on Swift. Okay, and and same for Kotlin, Java, and so on. Uh, Conscious of time, let's go to content. So we have our data model. Now what we can do, and again, this is a kind of a best practice. We can create some dummy content. So we can use those dummy contents in, in our test. For example, when we are building our application, our UI, right? So we can have some, some values. Um, so we can create a constructor. We can create a driver. Let's create some drivers. Right. And of course, I can create a driver. I have fields, text fields. I can also edit in Markdown. Interesting. 
Of course, since this is a date, we have a calendar, so on. We can link to an existing constructor and so on. Uh, but we can also do auto-generate seed data. So again, I can just auto-generate data and use those dummy, um, those those values as, as a test, right? Mm -hmm. How many driver we want to test? Uh, we want to create six. Interesting thing, we can add constraints. So for example, the first name uh, probably is a type of first name. So again, the, the seed data will use a dummy first name. Same for last name. It's last name. Uh, nationality, nationality, probably there is a country or there is country. So again, we have fake data, but at least related to what we have in the model. And finally, also date of birth. Uh, well, we can remove this. Uh, doesn't matter what is the day, date of birth. URL, it's a URL, something like that. Yeah. Doesn't change that much. We can generate data. Here we are. Price Robin from San Marino, permanent number 25, date of birth. Well, it's pretty young. That's why usually I put a I put a date of birth. It's not not racing in karting. Um, but yeah, and we have, for example, a URL, right? Again, it's a, it's a, yeah, please. And what you mentioned earlier about inviting users to Amplify Studio, this would be a thing that uh, a user that doesn't have access to, to the AWS console would do. Instead of building uh, your own CMS, perhaps you can invite users to just enter data straight into the tables. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, that's that's the, the, the interesting thing. Again, kind of business user or content mm. managers, right? Uh, if you're doing, a, I don't know, a blog type of application, Basically, you can manage content here. Uh, right. Kind of a lightweight CMS, of course. Yeah. Uh, not, not so many advanced features, but kind of a lightweight CMS for sure. So we created a driver. Uh, let's move to library conscious of timing. Uh, so if you remember things to do, uh, it was create a model, deploy, create content, and then build the UI, right? So what we did as AWS, again, was trying to solve, a, I, want, I don't want to call it a, an issue, but let's say a pain in the neck. So what happens is um, sometimes if you are a developer, you're working with designers, right? Especially as a, in the front end. And sometimes there is a kind of a... Um, miscommunication, let's say, because designers use their tools and then the assets they create are sent over to, to developers. But sometimes all the details are not exactly translated pixel by pixel uh, by the developers because it's hard, right? You have to, it, I remember those days when I was doing those things. It was It was very hard, right? So the idea is, um, okay, let's try to create some sort of automatic integration between one of the most popular tool for, for designers and Amplify. So we created this integration with Figma. Figma is a popular tool for designers. The designers used to do prototyping of the uh, user interface to create components, to create buttons, labels, all those things, themes like, uh, you know, colors and font sizes and, uh, and so on. Uh, and basically, we have this integration between Figma and Amplify. And the interesting thing is that we can import in Amplify the components created by our designers in Figma. And then we can use those components as high order component in React. This integration works only with React currently, right? Uh, but you can basically use it as a higher order component and you can copy paste it in the in your application and use it. So let's have a look. Uh, if we hit get started, uh, basically the integration works using the Figma file link. Figma works with a share link. So what we can do, we can hit use our Figma template. So basically the Amplify team created a standard Figma template for Amplify. So if we click that link, 
AWS Amplify UI kit, right? We can duplicate it. And once we duplicate it, um, what we have is we have the file ready to be used in, in Figma. Hmm. So, and what you have is primitives. So for example, icons, let me make it, otherwise it's impossible to, to show. Uh, you have icons, right? You have badge, you have buttons, right? This is a standard file provided by Amplify. And of course you can, you can change it. You can, uh, you can modify fonts, colors, and, and um, you have ratings. All primitives are in the left. Let me make it bigger again, are in the left sidebar, right? These are the primitives, text field, password field, radio button, and so on. But you also have components, so more complex uh, components ready to be used in your, in your application. So for example, you have what is called Ampligram. <laughs> Ampligram is basically a uh, kind of a social network photo sharing type of component, right? You got the uh, icon, the name of the user, the picture, classic stuff to share, command, like, things like that. You have a product page, a product card, things like that. So what you can do, you can basically uh, share this profile this, um, sorry, this um, Figma file, right? And import in your project and use the component like, like they are. You can change them, for example, if, and you can clone them. So we can clone the profile car. If we select the profile car, uh, there is, for example, um, an edit duplicate, for example. So we can use the component as it is, create a new one for example, and make it a little bit different, like this one. This is a little bit different. Um, this is going to be a little bit different. Uh, so this is, let me call it driver card, right? It starts from the profile card, but we, we change it, right? So now here we have the driver card. One thing to remember is here, you select the profile card, you detach the instance, so now all the items are uh, selectable, basically. Otherwise, since we, we clone the profile card, we just have the component as it is, as a single component, but we actually want to manage every single label or button in the component itself. So what we can do, since, since this is the driver car, we don't have followers, right? We just have probably the nationality, right? So we can remove the icon, for example, and we can make this label here italic just to, uh, let's say, showcase that we did something uh, light, let's say, oh, bold. Yeah. We made something different, right? Uh, then we, can ha we have this share button, right? So if we hit share, we have the link. This is the copy link. And the link will be must be pasted here, right? So what happens now? Amplify is fetching the whole Figma file from Figma. So um, so we imported the color system again. This is the default created by the by the Amplify team. If we change that in in Figma, then here we have the new team, the new theme. Uh, we can accept all changes and then moving to components, we have zero of 29 updates and review. So we can review every single component imported or we can accept everything. Let's say accept all. What we have now, we have all primitives, the theme and also the components. And guess what? We have the driver car here. Right. So we have the driver card here uh, with the right design, because if you go to the profile it is actually a little bit different, right? Mm. It's not bold. 
So this is exactly what we created in Figma, what our designers created for us in Figma. Yeah. We can do configure. What we can do, this is the cool part. The so magic. the magic driver car is mapped to uh, a property named driver of type driver, right? Then what we can do is, okay, the image is basically set prop child properties. It's a child property of the component because it's a sub component, right? Mm. So the source of the image, so we can bind the on click, we can bind the source, we can bind the alt, right? Let's say that the source is actually binded to what? We have some suggestion. Well, let's say driver.url. If in the URL we have the driver image, that's it. Interesting enough, now it's blank. Why? Because it's using real data we have in the data model. Hmm. And if you remember, we created dummy URL. These URL are not real. That's why it's blank. And I can shuffle data. So basically I can use, I don't know, different drivers and, and things like that. So the name, it's this one, is set properties. That's another interesting thing. The label is the first name, concatenate with a space bar, set a custom value, concatenate with the last name, right? If we do shuffle preview data, these are uh, the data we have in the, in, the, in, the, um, in the data model. And here, maybe we can put uh, the, the uh, still a label and we can put the permanent number, right? That's an interesting number. Uh, I'm not sure if it uh, if it makes it on the on the car, but that's it. Um, and then here we can put the nationality, right? So the label is actually the driver nationality, right? Again, still white here, but you got it. Yeah. So if I go back in the content and I change uh, the URL for one of the um, driver, let's say the San Marino one. About a minute to go now. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think it's... <laughs> no rush. Uh, no rush, of course. Uh, let's make it, let's use this one. It's definitely not uh, a URL of a driver, but... It. So Prince, uh, Prince Robin uh, has a real um, URL. If you go back to the um, to the driver card, we go to configure. We can also create a collection. Why the collection is important? Because we can render a list of driver cards, right? Classic mm. uh, list. So we can do create collection, driver card collection. Let's create it. It's gonna be a list, as you can see. It can be a grid, if you if you prefer. Let's say, right? You have a list. You can also do pagination or uh, have a search at the top. So since we have one minute, what's the next step for all of you folks? Get component code. So right. in your React, it can be a, uh, like the blank React app, okay? You do the pool. So you, you basically download everything, every single configuration we created in, in Amplify. You do the pool of all configuration. You copy paste the import in your app.js, for example, and then you use it. The component itself has, you know, uh, all the logic implemented to actually do the query and create a collection. Very cool. All right. I, I think we could have gone on for another hour to cover everything, but maybe that's a reason to have Stefano back uh, for another episode. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> I think that's basically it. All right, Stefano, we have to cut. I want to thank you very much for joining on joining us today. Thanks for all the viewers for joining as well. And I will see you again next week. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Bye.